and I'm the Managing Director of the Kestrews Institute, and I would like to welcome you to the first of our three Winter Learning Lab conversations. Um, and as usual, I'm very pleased to see the diversity of the collective group. I, I know from the list of people that Stephanie sent me that this is a group that's very global and coming from all kinds of organizations and playing a variety of roles, whether leader, coach, consultant, etc. cetera. And, um, and I also see some of you who have come to our labs in the past, and I think there are some new faces too, which is very nice to see. Um, so for those of you who haven't attended in the past, the Learning Lab conversations were created at the outset of the pandemic. And really they were created in order to make a space for reflection, for you to share experiences and to discuss leadership. Um, and so we hope to provide you with an opportunity to step back and make sense of what is happening in yourself, what's going on for your teams and in your organization. Um, and like you, we're eager to learn from the exchange. So this is an, a, an exchange rather than being uh, a lecture. Um, the three upcoming labs that we're doing this winter aim to look forwards and to consider how you as leaders can positively and proactively influence the culture in your organizations, the culture that's starting to, to I guess, be shaped, especially after the, the, the past year and a half of the pandemic. Today's learning lab, which is entitled The Leader's Guide to Flourishing, Moving from Surviving to Thriving, will be run by Katie Vi Associate Claire Pointing and Andrea Foote. And uh, just quickly, a couple of technical considerations. Please mute yourself, as I see most of you are doing when you are not speaking, so that we don't have too much um, background noise. And the session, as you'll see, is being recorded, but all the small group discussions are not recorded and will remain confidential to enable it to be a little bit more of a safe space. Um, and so last but not least, before I hand over to Claire and Andrea, I would really like to thank them for making this space for us possible and for sharing their thoughts and um, uh, evolving thoughts uh, about culture and the pandemic. Um, and then I'd also like to thank the KDBI team who've been drivers behind the Learning Lab conversations to make this um, a smooth process and to make sure you all knew about it and came. And so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Claire and Andrea, and I hope we have a, a, a lovely session together. Thank you very much, Oriane, and um, thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, this is, a, as Oriane said, it's the third Learning Lab series that we've run. We sort of started running them about, I don't know, about 14 months ago, um, primarily because we realized that certainly during the pandemic, we, we couldn't be experts. We actually had to put together a group of people to have discussions so that we could share our collective wisdom and have collective learning. And so this space, as Orianne says, is very much about not us telling you what the future looks like. It's not going to be what are the five C's for hybrid working or 10 things that will make you a successful leader in the future. This is very much around what are the things that we're seeing and observing both in our clients and ourselves that make us curious and as we look to the future, how can we begin to think about those things in a way that will be helpful and effective, both for the cultures that you work in and for your behaviours as leaders as well? So that, that's sort of the thinking behind it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk, Andrea and I, for about 15, 20 minutes. And then you're going to go into small breakout groups to discuss a couple of topic, topics. We're then going to come back, share what you've discussed in your groups share a little bit more content and then have another small group discussion in the same groups before you come back and then we wrap up. So it will take about an hour and a half. Um, we'll finish on time and hopefully you'll be curious at least if not fully enjoy what we're going to talk about. So hopefully this will be uh, interesting. I'm really looking forward to it. I was giving a lecture yesterday for an hour to a bunch of lawyers and who I couldn't see and who I got no response from and it was like talking into a soulless pit of despair. So today, rather than a soulless pit of despair, what we're going to talk about is flourishing. And many of you will have seen the New York Times articles on languishing, which then prompted an article on flourishing. And this KDVI series is very much about looking forward and looking at what it is that's happening within the world at the moment, um, where the emotional behavior of leaders 
is having an impact. And I think you could say that the Learning Lab series that we've run over the past three sessions have all been about the emotional experience and the emotional journey of leaders and organizations through the pandemic. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna start off by thinking about flourishing. And when Andrea and I were putting this session together, we really wanted it to be about looking forward and thinking about how leadership and organizations can plan for what's gonna come after the pandemic. And so looking at the dictionary definition of flourishing, it's when people experience positive emotions, positive psychological functioning and positive social functioning most of the time. And one of the things we're gonna to come to talk about in a few minutes time is how can we be alert to what our emotions are doing, what our psychological function is doing, uh, and how is that playing out in the decisions that we are making and the decisions our clients are making at the moment? So why is flourishing important as we sort of stand here in December 2020? And I think one of the reasons that flourishing becomes increasingly important is that we're caught in a sort of a slightly weird world, which is on the one hand, governments, leaders, individuals are desperate for the pandemic to be over. They're desperate for us to be in a space of certainty, in a space of moving forward and looking forward. However, you know, with the Omicron variant coming, uh, with the reality of winter coming, we're still really in the middle of a pandemic, even though there's a lot of activity planning forward. And so as we look forward, we need to be able to move from what has been an inherently survival mindset for the last 18 months or so into something that's much more forward looking, much more positive, much more proactive planning. And, and why do we say this? Well, I think we have this weird sort of conflation of the moment of desire and reality. And the desire is for certainty. And this is what I talked about in my previous learning lab a few months ago, is that when we're, when we're caught, caught in a world of ambiguity, one of the ways we cope with that is to create the illusion of certainty. And so we hear lots of language at the moment. You read loads of articles. If you read Harvard Business Review, if you read INSEAD Knowledge, you will see there are lots and lots of articles giving advice as to how to frame the new normal, what hybrid working is gonna look like. Um, we talk about 80% vaccine coverage. We talk about boosters. Well, everything is being framed in a very certain way. And yet the one thing we know is that today's new normal is not gonna be next month's new normal. It's not gonna be six months times new normal. Yesterday in the FT, there was an interesting article which, which talked about the fact that K, KPMG have decided that all of their auditors in the UK have to be back in the office four days a week, or they have to be on client site. They are not allowed to work from home more than one day a week. And if they do work from home, it is only for designated tasks. That is KPMG's auditors new normal today. That is not the new normal they had back in August when they had flexible working. So we're in a constant state of flux framed as certainty. And, and why does that matter? Why do we need to be alert to that? Well, I think the reason we need to be alert to that is that we've been working with clients, and I know a number of you on this session may have seen some of this, but these are universal themes that are coming out of clients that we're working with, that as we see new ways of working emerging in practice, there are three meta themes that are coming out very, very strongly. There's alignment and clarity. So you need to be proactively um, designing how people work and communicating it. There needs to be sustainable working. The pandemic has created this sort of blurring of the personal and professional boundaries. The sanctity of the home has been eroded. And in some ways that needs to be reestablished to create well-being and mental health and effective working. And the third is emotion and connection, possibly the most elusive and possibly the hardest to measure. But it turns out that of these three, they aren't equal. They play out in different ways in every organization and in every team. But the more we talk to leaders and the more we experience and observe what's happening in organizations, what we're actually seeing is that emotion and connection, whilst it may not be the easiest to identify and see, is actually at the very root of creating flourishing organizations. And I'm gonna hand over to Andrea now to talk about this. And so really that's what we're starting to see to, uh, to evolve um, 
it really is the piece that's very hard to attend to. And we're going to share a little bit about our experience of that in putting this presentation together. Um, but that um, creating the space to reestablish connections and being alert to the um, perhaps the emotional mood music that's playing um, in the background of organizations and in yourself um, is something that we we are um, uh, finding something that's quite elusive. It's hard to pay, pay attention to those pieces. Um, I know we were thinking about, um, I think a quote from Satya Nadella Claire yeah, in our and conversations. Yeah, and he said, um, you know, one of the, so Satya Nadella's CEO of Microsoft, and you know, he's sort of a bit of a poster child for new ways of leading. And one of the things he said was, you know, one thing we have really learned during the pandemic is that strong connections have become stronger, but weak connections have become weaker. And if we don't pay attention to reestablishing those connections, uh, you know, you are going to end up with a culture that is not sustainable. So for us, the aspect we've been thinking about is we have seen a real drive to policy states, that, uh, you know, activity, decisions, structures, um, really at such a great place. And in the conversation, the chat just before this session, we were talking about how, I think, it, you know, Ariane mentioned it had been happening even within her world, that that rush to the, the all compelling busyness starts to take over. Um, and being able to make the space to think about what holds the, the, the culture, to, what is the culture really, the people, um, and what binds them is, is, is not being looked at, not being held. Um, and so without finding ways to reestablish those connections, um, organizations are living in a survival mode. They're, they're, they're running on the banked connections, the emotional connections from pre-COVID times. I know one of my clients, they've had a third, um, they've employed, they've had a turnover of a third of people in the last two years. Um, and so they've got people who really haven't been part of that pre-COVID environment, um, all struggling to try and find their way and really get, get the, the feel of the place. Um, and for us, it's a bit like nature. When Claire and I were chewing over how to represent this, um, we thought about the idea of the tree where, you know, you really see all the detail, you see all the branches, the, the, the focus on all the working, the processes, the structures, but it's that root ball that you can't see that extends way below the visible line, but it's what really holds the organisation up. Um, so, um, do you want to bump to the next slide there? So really, uh, this was where we were at. When we came into this, um, Th that strong sense that we're we're coming to some new normal and that uncertainty is diminishing, but that equally, still we're we're living in a, a very unsettled world. Um, but the articles, you know, we were talking about articles that we'd seen in the last couple of weeks. The, the, they're focusing on lots of detail, the practicality of hybrid working, lots of conversations about technology that's going to police home workers looking at eye gay, you know, really not creating that sense of trust around individuals um, and discussions about how we're gonna cope with old biases showing up in new ways of working. The, the pace, the pressure is really quite intense. Um, and for us, that, that drive to action can feel very comforting. It feels the right thing to do. Um, and it's very, very present. Yeah, and I think also, you know, one of the senses I've had is that, and actually Oriane was talking about on, on, the, on the chat we had before the call, that, you know, it has been an insanely busy year. Um, and I can, I can look at what I see happening in the market I work in, and there's almost a mania, you know, of desperation to do things. I was contacted by some old clients in India um, who wanted to do something within a week of talking to me um and yet now they don't now they've kind of disappeared but, but the intensity the mania that we get pulled into um because people are desperate to create certainty to understand what it looks like going forward and for those of you who came to my previous talk i talked about something called the drama in the fog and last time i was talking about the relationship between ambiguity and certainty and how when we live in deeply amb ambiguous times we're actually drawn to create more certainty, to sort of 
contain our anxiety. And, and I use the metaphor of a ship in the fog because partly because I'm a sailor and I've sailed in the fog more than I like. I don't like being in the fog. It's a very exhausting environment to be in because you're surrounded by unseeable danger and your senses are constantly heightened. And I was actually talking to another colleague who came up with the, with the phrase drama in the fog. I'd like to claim, claim ownership of it, but actually somebody else came up with it. And I think that we are seeing both for ourselves and for our clients, a sort of a persuasion that the fog has lifted to a far greater extent than it has. And so we're planning for a world that we actually can't see and that we're not connecting with and we don't understand. And the one thing about, I know about sailing in the fog, the one thing I know about not being able to have clarity, not being able to see is it's exhausting because you're constantly on high alert. And so that then sort of took us to a, a sort of a, a sort of an inflection point as we were planning this session. Um, and what we want to do is just pause and spend a couple of minutes sharing our journey to why we think emotion is a key leadership behavior and why we think we're not being, we're not allowing ourselves to have enough time and space to think about it. So again, you know, I'm gonna hand back to Andrea to start this um, and then we're sort of uh, just run through our aha moment we had, which was triggered by putting this together. So just to, to put it in context, uh, context, you might see that it's daytime with Claire and it's nighttime with me. So um, I live in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm in Australia. It's dinner time. Um, so we live on opposite sides of the world. Um, and we are working to sex and we share we share a lot of what we do our thoughts we talk regularly and one of the reasons for that is we're sisters so we are close we're you know we're probably more close than most co-workers in, you, might in... heard, you might have heard andrea call me by my childhood name rather than <laughs> your name earlier we'll um... do childhood name bingo um <laughs> so you know, we, we are, we sh in theory, that means we should be pretty comfortable talking to each other. We've worked in different areas of work and gradually what we do has started to align. Um, and yet um, when it came to plan this event, we, we moved into that process thing. We started to dig through our articles and work and start talking to clients and look at references and frameworks to really support that conversation. Um, and I think that was when Claire and I started to wonder what we were doing. Well, I think um, what happened, actually what happened was I did what I always do, which is we had a planning call and I went, OK, this is the structure. Bang, 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 bang. You know, you know it's being a sort of a, a partly academic lawyer, partly strategy consultant. I've done the deck. Fantastic. We're good to go. And I ran Andrea through it. And at the end of it, Andrea went, yeah, yeah, I kind of get it. But I've realised I'm not flourishing and then burst into tears. And it was a and really I, important moment. And we talked about whether or not to share this on in this session. And I think it's really important we do because what we hadn't paid attention to was our personal emotions and what we were experiencing. And what's happened to both of us in the last year is that we have been pulled into action and activity and we've, we've lost sight of connection. We stopped creating spaces to reflect. We've stopped creating capacity to pause because we've been pulled by process and mania at the speed our clients want us to move at and that's no criticism of our clients it just is a reflection of what is happening to contain the exceptional world that we live in at the moment and, and what it reminded us of is or of a there's a an idea of um uh, something called the self as instrument which is um, finding a way to pay attention to the emotions that come up in you and to use them as a way of being curious about what's happening in and around you. So that time when Claire and I were talking about the mechanics of it and we actually had a moment to say, well, how are we doing? At that point, it was only then that I was in a position to be able to say, okay, I, I know we've got the detail, but I'm a, you know, I'm busier than ever. Everybody wants everything now. There's such a rush. And I personally don't feel like this is, this is the idea of flourishing that I'm after. Um, and so 
that sense of, and I know even within us as siblings, close as we are, that that was a hard conversation for me to have. I felt like I should be showing up, keeping up, you know, maintaining face. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and so... And I think also I, I got in touch with you outside of this because I became so overwhelmed by the work that I was doing that I actually phoned you up and said, I'm feeling really anxious. I am, I am just running at 100 miles an hour. And, you know, and I'm feeling really anxious. But we then didn't really stop to talk about why that was. And we didn't attend to the emotion. So mm -hmm. I think where we've got to just looking at the time is... We wanted to share that because we wanted flourishing to really be rooted in the emotional journey of leadership as well as the practical journey. So flourishing, when you think about flourishing, it tends to, you tend to see it in a, in a progression, which is nurturing, flourishing, thriving. And flourishing is that bridge between the effort that you put in to create something and the outcome that is created. It's that emotional link that enables you to deliver that and what we are seeing we think is that there is an action to connection spectrum and at the moment leaders are far too indexed to the action end because the connection end is hard and messy and harder to kind of map and so our invitation to you is to go into small groups for the next 15 minutes roughly and just think about whether your organization is being drawn to process um, rather than being drawn to sort of the wider cultural context that's being played out. And what emotions are you in detecting in your, you and your team that perhaps you, be, you should be paying more attention to? So are you being drawn to process rather than sort of the wider cultural context? And what emotions are you detecting in your, you and your team that you should be paying more attention to? perhaps. So we're going to go into breakout groups for 15 minutes, Yuki, and then we're going to come back and share perhaps some of the ideas and the themes that have come out of your groups. I think that's also partly down to the leadership um, strengths and, and deficiencies that you're talking about, that you know, the humility to not know is a really, really powerful thing. And yet it's also absolutely not something which I think Andrew and I were talking about this you know mm. for a leader to say I don't know um, and we need to find out is an incredibly brave thing to do in the certainly in western leadership culture so I think that's that's really fascinating may I ask a question I can, oh, sorry. yeah may I ask a question on that because um in the the, the pre-COVID could be really, you know, the ideal world in if you if you want to think like that. But in the, what the COVID also did was the flaws and inconsistencies in the pre-COVID world became very, very clear. And in the pre-COVID time, bad leadership could be accepted because people in the company excelled. And during the COVID time, that would really bring issues. Or may, I, I, that's at least what I think. I don't know if that's correct and what your experiences are. Yeah, I think that there's a saying that when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Um, <laughs> that, I think that has been, that what we've seen is people who lead and people who've been leading by accident, lead by design, lead by accident. Um, so that, um, you know, feels connected to what the question you're asking, Elsa. You, you have to be able to lead to cope in this new world. Yes, yes. I completely agree. And I also, I, I also think that um, COVID crystallised uncomfortable truths in a way that hadn't been, hadn't been crystallised before. So whether it's the sort of the, the, the economics that underpin what drives leadership behaviour, or, or whether it's uh, the sort of the illusion of success, because um, as you say, bad leaders could look successful. Um, and I completely agree with Andrea, you know, that, the, that when, when you come into true times of ambiguity, you know, bullish certainty does you no favors. 
um, you, you need leaders who can make decisions, but make wise decisions or appropriate decisions. What I think will be very interesting is how much of that we hold on to and how much of that gets gets lost in the creation, the recreation of leadership behaviours and the tolerance of leadership behaviours that are not necessarily helpful in the long term, but create the illusion of short term success. Mm. So I think there's something very interesting in that. I think it's a great point. Bertram, you were going to say. Yeah, I just wanted to make a start with a short summary of our group discussion and my my group members can compliment me. Um, well, the, the, the pandemic leads in the first instance to ambiguity and ambiguity leads to anxiety in most uh, places and, and fear. And um, the one learning is that you cannot move to flourishing if you give not in the first place, give enough space to acknowledge and contain that fear as, as a leader. And for that, the leader has to be comfortable with it by himself first. There is uh, a tendency if uh, things are uncertain and the demands on the leader that to jump to conclude to solutions and to, yeah, to maybe pretend that things get back as they were or whatever. And, and um, I remember uh, when, when, um, Gerstner, when IBM was in a very difficult situation uh, after having missed out the, the PCs completely, he said, the last thing we need now is a strategy. So he said, we, it will be a, a journey, uh, but we only make the next step now. And um, yeah, in our group, we discussed um, leaders who, on one hand, jump too quickly forward uh, by kind of yeah giving positive emotions but not giving enough space to that anxiety in the in the in the group first um, but also of leaders who do it quite well for example there was the example of somebody when he meets a client he always takes somebody from his uh, team with him or from his from the company it is a small company to yeah to have that exchange to create contact and to give space to talk to people to connect um, yeah and and another example was in a in a bigger company the whole strategy process by involving more more people than they would usually do by bringing in people from kind of uh, from a broader uh, level uh, to discuss mm -hmm. strategy moving forward. That's also an example where you create contact space and um, by the same time manage fear. So yeah, I think that's what I want to say at this point. <laughs> Maybe a small addition, because one of the things that popped up was how close some of the things that we experience right now um, of how well things that we experience right now can be seen when we think about through the parenting lens about it. Um, so, so that um, a lot of the things that parents have experienced with their children and have used to help their children grow is something that is also becoming more useful in understanding the situation in companies. Yeah. And there was also the view expressed that the pandemic has also lots of opportunities by bringing out, by stopping old habits essentially and, uh, and starting from new. And that's always an, an opportunity to make things much better. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting situation many leaders are in at the moment, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I think your point about ambiguity, and I'm, I'm obviously going to say this because this is what I did the last learning lab on, is absolutely spot on that if you can't be comfortable with ambiguity, then, and, and I think that there's a very interesting relationship between ambiguity and certainty that COVID has really crystallised in that ambiguity is a constant in our world. And this idea of managing through VUCA by being able to cancel ambiguity is nonsense absolute nonsense because we live in an, it, the very nature of the world it, it, it is it is ambiguous and that certainty is a tool that you use to navigate the small steps through ambiguity 
Um, and if anyone's interested, there's a recording of the talk I did last time on this, because I absolutely agree with you that the idea that you can make the world neat and tidy and get rid of ambiguity is one of the biggest threats to genuine leadership behavior. But I would say that because that's what I talked about. But, you know, I think I think that is a really important, really important point. Um, got just a couple more minutes before we share a little bit more content, which actually builds on a lot of what you've said, which is how leadership emotions influence culture. Has anyone got anything else they, they'd like to share? I know, Oriana, you've written quite a bit in the chat box. Do you want to just give a flavor? Well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, we had, um, we had a discussion about, uh, I guess, the speed at which everybody's trying to work. In fact, it's increased. And so um, uh, people are very tired. It's, there's, an, an, again, an unrealistic expectation on how quickly we can work. And, you know, there's a positive, we can, we can speak to you, Andrea, you're in Sydney, but that there's also the negative in the sense that um, people get called into meetings all the time so that you're kind of constantly in a meeting. Um, and then we talked about, um, Brad talked a little bit about his experience in Singapore, which is interesting, I think, because you can't really leave Singapore. So if you, um, many people haven't been able to see their families now for two years because they're not leaving mm. to, to visit them. Um, and, um, uh, you know, some of the people that they're working with might be in India and losing uh, family members, loved ones, um, uh, even a vacation. If you take a vacation in Singapore, sort of sitting in your home, so it's not really a rest. So there's this kind of, at, at the same time, they're in the office working together. So there's this a sense of normality, but at the se same time, there's all this other stuff still going on for people emotionally. Um, and then we talked um, a little bit about, uh, yeah, the, the danger that because of all these emotions are bubbling, that teams can kind of explode. Um, and, you know, if you haven't quite named the, the emotions that are going on, um, that explosion definitely feels like you can come from, from nowhere. We are disconcerting and confusing. And also takes a lot of time to repair, and which means that you have to then prioritize repairing rather than running still after all the work that you still have to do, and and the mounting pressure of anxiety that you're not doing that work while you're preparing something else. And then uh, there's a, I talked a little bit about this tendency to hide through being overwhelmed, just kind of like zoning out. And and you know I was talking about I have a ridiculously stupid app that one of my kids put on my my phone, and I've found that I'm sort of going back to that app just because it means that I don't have to think. I just completely turned my brain off, and I you know stopped and said to myself, "Why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. It's, I have so much to do, and yet I'm hiding somewhere. That's a an escape. It's a it's a process of hiding. So, yeah, some of the mm -hmm. thoughts that came up in the group." Yeah. Maybe members have things to add. I think it it's um, one aspect that you have the leader, and obviously then you have your the followers. The the what you bring up, Ariane, is um, for me related to the world of the followers is different. The assumptions one made about workforces in the past have shifted. Um, and there was a just a the recent Gartner Group um, research for Australia talking about the that expectation of people to go the extra mile. People's willingness to do that has diminished over COVID, potentially because of that burnout. Everyone's been running, um, and so old assumptions don't play the same way now. Um, everybody, everybody needs to find a space. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree with that. And I can sort of reflect back over the last year and how easy it's been to let space go. And one thing, one thing I've started doing is I go swimming in the sea. I live in Brighton. I live on the coast in the UK. So I go sea swimming as, as often as I can, even now. And I've realised that that's the one space I've, I've defended and kept um, away from busyness. Um, 
and I'm curious as to how we can reestablish, give ourselves permission not to be busy, which I think is something I'm finding incredibly difficult, even though I'm self-employed. Um, so there's something really, really um, systemic that's going on, that's echoing in, in, I think, in each of us. So thanks, that was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to go back to the slides and we're just going to take you through. Um, let me just, there you go. Just take you through a little bit more content before you go back into breakouts in a few minutes. So I think, Andrea, over to you. Thank you. Um, so really what we've been circling around is that um, the impact of the leaders is not to be underestimated in all of this um, and the, the focus of effort that's going in into the doing of the do um, runs the risk of having that a, a huge impact on the organization's capacity to to reach a point of flourishing um, and we're talking when we talk about behavior often that's very practical aspects of leadership um, we're talking about about both conscious and unconscious aspects of the leader yeah, and i think bertram picked up on this when he talked about not paying attention to anxiety um, mm. being being something that for, a, for perhaps a leader is going to feel quite messy but by ignoring the anxiety he's ignoring the under or she is ignoring the underlying mood, mood music that's, that's starting to drive the culture. Um, let me just move on. And, and one thing, you know, Andrew and I have been working on this idea, probably we started thinking about this over the summer, which was what is it that the leader does to culture? And we sort of came up with the metaphor of a magnet and this idea that leadership behavior, consciously or unconsciously, sets the cultural boundaries that, that have, you know, that people operate within and we put this together for law firms um, which is why it's got partners and associates but i think it's true that if you're a leader and you're focused purely on action and you're ignoring emotion then the organizational culture becomes very transactional very process driven and i think one of the things that happened during covid and i think this picks up on a number of points that came out in the discussion is that the power of leader behavior actually became less strong because um one, there was little choice in how people worked. Everybody worked from home if they were in knowledge industries, which most of us are. And so the power of the leader behavior became less um, influential in the day-to-day -day culture of how people got things done. But on the flip side, as we go back into thinking about how people are gonna work going forward, that leadership behavior is becoming increasingly strong again. So, you know, Thea gave the example of um, the fact that process is creating silos within some organizations as people battle out how their preferred culture is played out through the imposition of process and there's something very interesting about that because what's not happening is asking why are we putting this in place people are rushing to the how do we do it and what are we trying to put in place instead and why is driven partly by the emotion We'd like to just take you back to that metaphor of the tree um, and um, I really encourage you to do what, what we're doing now is to, to stop and ask yourself what effect might you be having unconsciously on your teams and organizations we've talked about we've heard people talk about that pressure the the, the processes that are driving them um, and when we are under pressure then our behaviors can go a little haywire um, we tend to default to some some of our strange um, default responses. Um, and so it's a question to think about how much of your leadership energies are you spending cultivating, not just pruning the leaves, but actually nurturing the soil, looking at that, that going deeper aspect of trying to get under the surface and think about what's happening in you and therefore what's happening in, in and around your, your culture and your people. Yeah, and I, think, I think it's interesting. I've just had a quick look at the chat and Georgia raised the question of, you know, the fact that the frame for psychological safety has changed. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you're not paying attention to emotion and you're just seeing the world through the lens of process, it's actually very hard to create psychological safety because those foundational elements aren't going to be there. So psychological safety shifts from being 
a way of thinking about culture and creating effective culture to going into the bucket of buzzwords that, that we see all too often in the business world. And I think, you know, this idea that busyness is driving things and that we're not taking time. I read a really interesting quote the other day that um, when we are overwhelmed with busyness, we tend to prioritize the urgent over the important. And this busyness is creating a sense of urgency coming back to this process point, which is potentially distracting from the importance of creating an appropriate culture for the way we work going forward. So one of the things we do see quite a lot is quite a lot of uh, organizations being drawn to um, reorganizations as a, as a consequence of COVID, whether it's physical location or it's team reorganizations without actually putting in the foundational elements of why they're doing it and how it's actually going to work in the long term. And Andrew doesn't know this, I've just put this slide back in, but I think it's important because it's your slide um, if you want to talk to it. But we were coming up with an analogy, you know, we, we discussed the magnet, you know, the push pull of that, but actually, do you have um, leaders expecting the organization to snap back? Is that the, the wish? That we just go back to how it was um or what can we think about that you would retain um rather than just you know letting it all ping back without thought and so so I promise this was going to be pretty short so we're going to pop you back into um discussion groups for another 15 minutes and really what we'd like you to to sort of build on is the conversation you had in the first um, in the first discussion group, but now also thinking about the unconscious impact of the behavior, the emotional behavior versus the action behavior of leaders on what kind of culture that it creates, positive and perhaps not as helpful as it could be. So how much attention are you paying to the emotion and connection? And how's that being reflected in your organization and you? How much attention are you giving to those foundational elements to create the culture that will support effective ways of working going forward? Because the leadership behavior creates the unconscious parameters of the culture. So hopefully that is enough for you to work on. Um, if we say 14 minutes, Yuki, that would be great. Popping back in nearly. Hi, Georgia. Hi. <laughs> Hi, that's right. I've seen your name. I didn't see you before. I just want to say hello. <laughs> uh, I've been hiding in the background. <laughs> I have oh. a, a bit of a cold, so oh, apologies no. to anyone. <laughs> no, we've had a few. Somebody else was going around feeling flu y, weren't they? Yeah. I think we've all, we've, all, we've all sort of become sort of uh, open to sort of picking up sort of coughs and sneezes. I know. I, mean, I don't well, go there's... anywhere though, so I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> the immune system having a party yeah <laughs> it's reminding me who's in charge <laughs> exactly you thought uh, welcome back everybody i think we're all back in the room back in the room um we are aiming to finish uh on the half hour so um if i hope you've had a good conversation in your small rooms we probably got time to hear from a couple of voices from what came up in your little in your discussions um, perhaps a couple of people we haven't heard from and and so we'll take probably about uh, six minutes or so for this bit I think anyone got something they'd like to share maybe I'll offer um, thank you Cynthia yeah together with Keith and Tim uh, we were we had this insight about uh, there was this quote presented that we can't be curious and anxious at the same time and, uh, and, and we all felt that taking the time for connections were so valuable uh, and, uh, and reflecting on the culture as connection takes time uh, for an introvert different than for, for an extrovert and it's how do you build this culture with the proper psychological safety where everyone can bring their diverse authenticity uh, in the room and, and how do we respect the energy it takes for each of us and not judge, not compare and, and, and so forth. 
So thank you guys. Did I say that? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cynthia. That sounds, um, in that, that's a very insightful reflection on everybody moves at their own pace. Um, even while this train of activity is happening around us. Um, yeah. And it reminds me of a conversation that we had, we were just chatting in our own small group about how at the beginning of COVID, we all created spaces to reflect. I created them, Claire, KDBI, put up these areas and yet that stopped. This is the first one I've done in quite a few months. So um, yeah. it's clearly hard to stop. And I think the flip side as well to to that insight, which I think is really is really helpful, is that the emotional engagement of the leader either creates that space for psychological safety and creates the capacity for connection, or it shuts it down as well, which I think is really really important. So, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? with some findings. I, I said, if I may report from, from our group, we had, a, we had a very nice exchange on, um, uh, you know, while we take care of our teams, who takes care of, of us, um, which is actually mm. a, a very important thing. Uh, I always say it occurs to me now, you know, what they say in an aeroplane, in the unlikely event of loss of cabin pressure, first secure a mask around your face and then assist any children traveling with you. So, of course, um, it, 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 it just hit me when, when else asked, uh, uh, you know, who takes care of myself. I said, I, I take care of myself. Oh, you're right. I, I don't need taking care of, but of course I do, because I, like everyone else, crack under pressure. And I am under pressure and I have fatigue of all sorts, digital fatigue, most notably. And then we had a nice chat on, on you know, the perspective of a family-owned business versus an organization um, uh, where, you know, the focus is, is different and the long-term perspective is different as well. And the luxury to be able to say no, to slow down versus um, the stress of having to keep the business going and, and having to position yourself on the action side versus the connection side uh, because the show must must go on somehow. So this um, uh, tension between these these two, it, it became clear to me that I am caught in this tension. Uh, and of course, I snap like the rubber band you showed. Um, it is it is it is because, normal. It is unavoidable because we are after all only human. Absolutely. Mm. No, thank you, Aliki. If I may add, uh, one of the things we mentioned in our group is that uh, leadership happens in action. And uh, uh, it's very often against the culture uh, to take time to reflect. <laughs> so it's important to create opportunities for leaders to have experience and normalization of this kind of behavior. I completely agree with that. And I think there's a really interesting thing, which is reflection feels like inaction, which mm -hmm. feels countercultural to most organizations, which are driven by busyness. But mm -hmm. reflection is the most important activity you can do. So it's not, in a, it's, it's not in action. It is actually an essential activity. But we have to give ourselves permission to do it, because otherwise we look like we are not complying with the cultural requirements. I think I and and there's a perspective on that, taking that time. Um, in one organization I've been working with, the idea that they would create reflection groups for their teams was regarded with suspicion because there was a fear that too much emotion would come up that would not be capable, the leaders wouldn't be capable of handling, that they would somehow break things. Um, it's a bit of an. Yeah, when we were talking about this, we were going to use a slide which was. Uh, a sign which said don't poke the bear um, <laughs> yeah. you know don't don't reveal too much emotion um and i've worked with a client where we wanted to get emotional connection into virtual teams to uh um Aliki, your point about emotion uh, fatigue and 
what they have is they have a spiral binder of emojis. And at the start of each of their meetings, they flip to the emoji that they feel because by showing the emoji, they can, they can express an emotion that they can't vocalize. Um, and I think that's really, really important that, that you can create ways of emotion coming in into, into exchanges as well. And, and there is something about emotions where I think a lot don't understand really that when they're, so what's often happening is that they want to avoid emotions because they see that it's a space where nobody is able to think. So they are not able to deal with that not being rational. Yeah, I yes. I think it's about the unmeasurables. And so in, in, a, in a world of the McKinseyization where everything <laughs> is measurable, is meaningful, and everything that can't be measured isn't, doesn't matter, I think that's one of the great untruths that has been crystallized by COVID is that actually it's the unmeasurable that matters more. Mm. And on that note, I think we're just, we wish to maintain our time. Um, very much appreciate everyone's contribution. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope it's been enriching. Um, and there are some more KDVI learning labs coming up in the future, do sign up. And we thought we'd sign off. I will hand back to Claire, having said thank you to all um, and let Claire finish up. Yeah, so I think just picking up on the theme that came out just now, you know, I think it's about giving yourself permission to look beyond the anxiety to curiosity, to not be overwhelmed by the fear of anxiety that you, you rush to action without connection. And I just want to finish with a poem that I know some of, I have, some of you will have heard me say before, but I think actually really encapsulates this. And it's by a woman called Erin Hansen. And it goes, there are freedoms waiting for you in the breezes of the summer skies. And you say, what if I fall? But oh my darling, what if you fly? If you can connect to emotion, you will flourish and you will fly. Thank you all for coming.